Hello everyone, this is Hesha Montasser, dispatching from Germany, in between me eating Kartoffelsalat and Bratwurst. Actually, no Bratwurst for me, but definitely Apfelstrudel. We're in a summer break right now, and we'll be back with new episodes in September. In the meantime, I wanted to share an episode you might have missed. In fact, this was the first episode with Mirna Ayed. Mirna has since then, among many other writing and art-related activities, released the book Sheikh Zaid, An Eternal Legacy, which she talked about on the episode. She was also a conveyor for the new book release, Cairo Eternal, by Mayid Deeb, whom we had on the show this past June. Have a listen and enjoy this episode. Mirna moved to Dubai in the early 1980s from Beirut during the Civil War. Almost everyone she knew lived in one of two locations, the High Regency in Deira, or the Intercontinental, now Radisson Hotel, on the creek. And the kids essentially went to one of two schools, Shuaifat or Mawakib. Mawakib and Shuaifat had the same sort of diasporic or nationality breakdown. Um, and I have to say that one of the amazing things about growing up in Dubai was that um, the multiculturalism, which is still prevalent today, but I had friends from everywhere and I had teachers from everywhere. Without going into too much detail, I'd have to say that people who went to Mawakib were stronger in Arabic. I'd say that, but people who went to Shwaifat were stronger in English. Um, it, it's something that I notice up until today. My daughter, who is four years old, just started big school. Um, during the orientations, I would see all of my former classmates. So their kids are now in the same school. Uh, a lot of us stayed, a lot of us uh, left, but we're all in touch. Each of us, you know, uh, sort of became engaged in the arts for different reasons and for different ambitions. Um, but I think that we have one common denominator, which is why I'm still working in the arts. Um, and I think I, I will forever be. Um, it gave me a lot of answers. So growing up in Dubai um, for close to 38 years now, um, if I find it so difficult to say I'm Lebanese. Um, I'm not just Lebanese. I am, I am a Marathi, I am Syrian, I am Saudi, I am Turkish, I am Iranian, I am Pakistani, I am Indian. I am all of these because that's what growing up here was like. And uh, I, I found uh, my identity, my collective identity in the arts. It gave me a lot of answers. It gave me a lot of background. It gave me a lot of history, and it continues to. So after finishing school and university, Mirna wanted to pursue her lifelong passion of writing with the ultimate goal of being a war correspondent. And I actually worked with Reuters for a little bit, but I uh, very naively <laughs> realized that when you work as a journalist, you're not allowed to use adjectives. <laughs> I totally didn't know this. And so when I worked at, at uh, Reuters, it, it hit me pretty hard. And this was, this was 2003. So this was the cusp of America invading Iraq. It was all dismal. It was so doom and gloom. And the thing is, journalism can be very depressing. Um, and I quickly realized that, wait a second, I, I do want to write, but that's not what I want to write. Uh, I want to describe things. So more storytelling rather than reporting, right? It's 100%. like knowing you for some time now. I think it's something you do really well. Even if you're putting on an event, you always find an angle to tell a story. I, I think there's a... I, I'm, I, I don't know how to describe this in words, ironically, but there's always a story in my head. Always. And I think this is so reflective, reflective of our culture and subcultures because we are that, we are storytellers. I mean, even in our Arabic language, when we say bi'ulu, alu, you know, we, we, we say this, they say, uh, what did they say? Who said that, you know, we are, we are storytellers. So then you wind up becoming the editor-in-chief at Canvas. Now Canvas was this pioneering magazine at the time. It was a lifestyle magazine, kind of this Vanity Fairish, but art focused publication. Uh, I had such an amazing time, and 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 like you say, Hashem, it was early days. It was like the a nascent art scene. Everybody was excited. There was a collective spirit. Um, it was it was just so enriching. It was so inspiring, and and the magazine had this incredible vision, or actually multiple visions. And it was a great team. And we had you know Ali, who who you know is the publisher of the magazine. 
he had a, he has amazing vision, amazing creativity. We, he was so inspirational. And we were the first. Uh, I think actually uh, we we launched, uh, and I think a couple of months later or earlier or something like that, Bidun also launched. Bidun is another Middle Eastern publication like Canvas, and they were doing a great job as well. In fact, they went online and explored digital very early. That may seem normal now, but it really wasn't back in the day, and that was considered pretty pioneering. The pressure to get online was and still is enormous. I would say the bigger pressure that we had was the magazine itself, as in, um, I, 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 you know, I still strongly feel, as I did then, that the magazine has to remain as a physical, it has to have a physical presence. But at the time, we were looking at our subcontract division and the production of books. So thankfully, I had produced a few in my time at Canvas. Uh, some were focused on the arts and then, of course, the luxury world because they, they intersect a lot. That's what I was really, really more keen on. I thought that the online was inevitable. It was going to happen anyway, whether we liked it or not. But the books, the books, I, I, I feel very strongly about books. <laughs> <laughs> I love that tactile feeling of, of of touching a magazine personally, but most of those publications from back then have either gone online or don't really exist anymore. They've vanished. Was that a challenge for Canvas and the business model, talking to publishers and others? Listen, I think it has something to do with, uh, like you say, the tactile experience. Nothing, nothing, nothing can take that away. Yeah. Okay, the idea of holding a, a, a book in your hands um, and if you're, you know, if you are physically drawn to the texture of the paper, the, you know, the sound that the paper makes as you turn the page and also the way illustrations look on a page. Um, I know it probably sounds cliche, but books are captivating and I, I love them when they're new and I love them as they age. I love the way the paper changes color. I love my, my little sticky notes and, 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 and other notes and whatever. I, I like, I just like it. And I like, I love a bookshelf. And this is one of those interesting things. I mean, people often talk about the demise of books, but it hasn't really happened. It took an initial hit, of course, with the advent of eBooks and the Kindle and so on. But at some point it leveled and today there's still quite healthy growth. In fact, at the Lighthouse, what we found is that uh, books are one of the main gifting items that we sell. Music and it doesn't ears. matter to us whether people, you know, give them as gifts or stack them in their homes and their coffee tables or read them. I don't entirely mind personally. What we've also seen in the Middle East, you know, arts, culture, books, they're all generally merged as sort of a general lifestyle category. And that really is what drew me to Canvas back in those days. It was a, really one of the first lifestyle magazines and it spanned all these areas. I think one of the reasons why you're saying that is because we got into people's homes. We, we had that access, which was incredible. Um, so because we were still are an authority and, and, you know, we had a dream team, honestly, we had such an amazing bunch of people working with us. Um, you know, we, we were close to people. And the arts is a very warm place, if you want. <laughs> it can be quite cold. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we had that familiarity with people. We genuinely loved what we're doing. And we genuinely wanted to know about you, about what's in your home, about, about what you're drawn to. And so that access allowed us to get into people's homes. And this is how I think that the lifestyle positioning comes into play. Um, we didn't just get into the homes of collectors in, in your age group, uh, but we also got into the homes of, of older people who are, uh, I, I don't want to say difficult, but they're more private. Uh, and, and it's something, I think, to say in the Middle East and specifically in the Arab world, to say to someone, hi, I want to come in, do an interview with you and take pictures of what you own. And I remember reading that. I mean, a lot of us got, including myself, got to know about some of the most amazing collections through magazines like Canvas. And and the collectors did it willingly. They understood they weren't doing it from a vantage point of, of showing off, but from a vantage point of education. Ultimately, I think it served an amazing purpose. And then you took that and you sort of, towards the end of your stay there, did you feel you wanted to be much more inserted into the art world or what made you leave Canvas? Um, I, there were two things actually that uh, you know brought my Canvas days to, to an end. Um, one of them was um, 
um, I got married and then pregnant with our first child. She's four and a half. Her name is Noor and um, she's absolutely wonderful. It's not because she's my daughter, but she is. <laughs> so so Noor uh, happened, uh, but also, again, naively, uh, professional na naivete, I thought that the only way to um, grow and promote and support the regional art scene was through a publication. Yes. I was wrong. That is that is correct, but there are other ways. And I didn't know. Uh, and I, I still don't know all of them, but I knew that there were other routes. Um, and so I, I had timed my resignation with the birth of Noor and thought I would I would give myself some time to 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 understand motherhood and and to see what I wanted to do next. Hashem, two months later, after giving birth to Noor, I was so bored. <laughs> I'm glad this came up. I mean, globally, this is something that comes up with women and men even. In fact, different people have different reactions to parenthood. And it's important to take time to, to talk about how you feel. But then you felt bored, which is something not a lot of people admit to. So I give you a lot of credit for that. It's brave for you to say that you were bored and you wanted to go back to work because a lot of people suppress that feeling because they think they shouldn't be bored. I think, you know, yesterday we, we, we ran into some friends at the mall and they just had a, had a baby and she's now three months old, beautiful child. And, and the father asks me, so who's lucky, us or you? What, what phase are we at? And I said to him, I didn't know that then, but what you have is a walk in the park. She's eating and sleeping. Whereas with Noor, you know, she's, she's, a, she's a functional little adult. She needs my attention all the time. I can't just give her a rattle anymore. <laughs> so I think, um, I mean, now I know this. Sure. Obviously, in the beginning, as, as you know as well, we are overwhelmed. Number one is overwhelming. You think everything is, is augmented and everything is, is huge, and, but it actually isn't. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of got the hang of it. And, and I have a f fantastic support system. My, you know, my family live here, my husband's family, you know, where they, they were coming in and out. Um, and there's not much to do. When we come back, how Mirna is now shaping a regional narrative for arts and culture. Welcome back. You're listening to the Lighthouse Conversations on my chat with Mirna Ayed. Before the break, you heard how Mirna reached this point once her daughter was adjusted that she wanted to do something, get back to work and follow her passion. And that passion is shaping the regional narrative for arts and culture. So while I was at Canvas through to now, I have a sentiment about how the West reports on art from this region. Um, I, I, I don't think it's great. I think it's slanted. I think it's, it's seen through a, you know, a very biased lens. My focus is really you know, North Africa, Middle East, South Asia, Iran and Turkey as well. So I'm, I'm, you know, I pay attention to that. It's my remit. And um, I don't like it. I still don't. I don't think it's, it's in-depth enough. I don't think it's re reported well enough. I don't think it's described enough. I don't think, that, you know, the protagonists are engaged enough. Yeah, I can't help but agree. In my experience, one of the downsides of this narrative that I've seen with artists is that they fall to this trap. Uh, to create art that blends well with that narrative because that brings them recognition or more coverage or even fame. But I do think that artists should do whatever they want to do, that they can be coached and advised on those fronts. Yes, I wanted, I wanted to tell them the truth. Yeah. I wanted people to know the truth and I wanted, I wanted them to know how beautiful it is. Um, and so I reached out to... Um, I, I wrote for a lot of Western publications minus the National that's based here. So I wrote for the art newspaper, the New York Times, Art Forum, Artc, Artnet, Wallpaper. Um, on the one hand, I reported on uh, the very obvious, as in uh, there, there is the Sharjah Biennale, and, and you know, there is Art Dubai. I mean, these are, these are obvious. So I was reporting on those, but then what I, you know, the, the other angle was to, to talk about the ones that you don't know. Uh, so I knew, for for example, for, for lack of a better example, we all know about Shirin Nishat. 
Um, she she she's a great artist and and so is Mona Hatoum. But did you need to know more about them, or did you need to know about a guy called Abdul Rahman Qatanani, who is originally Palestinian and who lives in the refugee camp in Lebanon in Sabra? Um, you know, I I wanted to tell you about those you did not know, and I wanted I wanted to tell you our story. I didn't want you to tell me because you weren't saying it right. I wanted to tell you the way we see it through our lens and why he's so important. Um, so that was, that was my main focus. And I, I wanted to, you know, keep it super wide. So the way that I wrote for the, for the New York times, it was very different from the way that I wrote for art forum was very, you know, uh, and that was a challenge. And I wanted everybody to know. So, the, so Hashem who reads the New York times might not read art forum and so on and so forth. So I, I kept it quite wide. Um, it it took a lot of time, Hashem, I have to say. To get the tone right? Yes, but, but also people really underestimate the time and effort that it takes to write a story. It might be 500 words, but do you know how many people you need to speak to? How much research you need to do to write that 500 words? And what kind of reactions were you getting? Maybe from an article you wrote... And was their reaction different from people from within the region versus outside of the region? Yes, they were very different. Uh, first of all, locally and regionally, um, I felt a lot of gratitude, which, which really humbled me. Uh, because a lot of the galleries and the artists here felt, oh, finally, you know, someone, someone is writing it the right way. And then when I traveled abroad, um, you know, people, people looked looked at our region and its and its you know artistic output in a different way there was a there was i don't want to say it was because of me that's impossible but there was a the the questions were a lot more fine tuned uh there was a, a lot more respect and there was a there was a greater interest and according to you what do you think is missing in the region today what do we need to do next oh hashem that's that's a huge question i'm going to try and break it down from sort of my daughter's level through to where we are. Um, your, your kids are in school today, and uh, so is my, my daughter. Uh, but there is nothing in, in the curriculum or in the art curriculum that tells them about art from this region. Uh, in fact, I was going to sign up Noor to a, a, an arts masterclass after school activity, and the advertisement said, learn how to draw like Picasso. I'm not saying replace Picasso with, you know, Mahmoud Saeed or someone else, but there's zero access, there's zero introduction. Um, and that's, that's the number one mistake because that's where we need to start. Um, so if, if we don't cultivate that sort of uh, cultural appreciation, if we don't tell them who they are, of course she's going to grow up. I mean, if, if, if I wasn't her mother, of course she's going to grow up knowing all about Van Gogh and Picasso, just like I did, by the way. Um, but so, so I think on the educational level, it needs to start there. So that's government. That is one thing that uh, I think is fundamental. Um, and then I, I feel like within schools, um, you know, to, to nurture that, that appetite, that knowledge, you know, in tandem with that will be an appreciation or a responsibility to defend the arts. Uh, that's, that's the problem that I find across the board today. So whether it's, um, you know, individual, organizational or governmental, um, I don't feel that we have as many people feeling like they are compelled to patronize. And patronizing is not buying. Okay, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go and, you know, drop, I don't know how much money on, on an artwork, but be a patron, support. Yeah. And support means what you're doing. We're talking about it because this is not about now. This is about back then and tomorrow. Um, so that's what I, I think, you know, the, 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 big, the big number one would be to feel responsible. To feel, you know, that, that you must do this. You must. It's essential. Yeah, and there are a lot of organizations doing good work, but I feel perhaps the, the base is narrow. The ratios aren't quite right. How do we enlarge that base? 
I don't know if I mean I, I'm not I'm I'm not a person who can who can tell you um, you know about about ratios. So example, for example, the population of the Emirates in comparison to the number of cultural institutions. I don't think we can ever have too many, but I think. Uh, I think what Sharjah is doing, I think what the Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development, I think what organizations like Al Sirkal, I think what they're doing is amazing. Maybe the conversation that we should be having is how do we reach a wider audience? How do you talk to someone like my mom? It's how, how do I make you come to the show? You know, how do I make sure that it's not the usual suspects at the vernissage? So I think it starts again with the school. If the school says we need to go, and the kids are going to go back home and say, mommy, we need to go. Okay, so you you just start to create more noise, I think. But I think there's more than one ways. I think there's hundreds of ways that we can do this. But I, I have to say, I, I commend the organizations here for what they're doing. Um, and I think more more importantly is, this is another thing that I would I would get from my Canvas days through to now, from the West, you know, they always want to criticize. They always want to say, but you don't have a museum. But, you know, the auction houses came first. But but there's no collecting power. There's no spending power. And I want to say, we're not even 50. Correct. We are not even 50 years old. What this country has achieved in so little time is remarkable. And it's because of a committed few, you know, yourself included, who have contributed to this so... So, you know, cut us some slack. You're doing a variety of work now, consulting and otherwise. Do you focus on your organizations or can an individual come to you and say, I know, I'm 30 years old, I would like to start my own art collection. Is that something you can help with as well? Do you give advice? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open. So uh, uh, when, I, when I set up this uh, consultancy and it was to, to, to remain a legal entity, basically. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, establish this to focus on one. It was, it was everybody. And, and listen, I mean, I have some friends who, you know, what do you think? Um, I, I'm more than happy to help. This, this is basically, uh, my, my middle name is I'm more than happy to help. <laughs> I don't want to do it for a commercial reason. If you are a young collector and, um, uh, and you want to, let's say if you're a non-friend young collector <laughs> and you wanted to, you know, to, to begin collecting, then yes, I mean, I'm sure we can work together. I mean, for example, for example, um, and, I, and I'm sorry that I can't remember his name at the moment, but a few years ago, uh, only, only a year ago, actually, I went to Saudi and I go quite a bit to Saudi. And I attended this show in a gallery in Jeddah. And in the corner, uh, there were images. Um, th so there were two images within one frame. On the left-hand side, you saw this gorgeous image of uh, a landscape, really beautiful. Uh, hills with, you know, homes and there was a river and I don't know what. But then on the right-hand side, it, there was a completely blurred image. It was it was how your computer looks when it's, when it's dead. Um, and apparently, this is a Yemeni photographer who was flying out from Yemen to Saudi Arabia, but whose hard drive went bust. So he published the, the images of, of, of Yemen as he photographed it, but Yemen as it looks like now. And I, I, I was totally arrested by, by the concept, but also the time. So, so this guy who is super obscure, and who's who's based in Saudi and who, you know, makes a living out of uh, taking studio photographs, but also does this on the side and sends all the money back home. I mean, that that entire story moved me. This, this is a guy that I think, um, you know, deserves something. There's a lot of uh, young artists in Iran. There's a wealth of young artists in the Emirates, in Saudi. I think we just need to, um, as you would go into a store and, and see the latest collection, you know, being hung, ask them, do you have the older collection? Do you have anything that you haven't shown yet? Just be a bit more curious, you know, ask the extra question, just go the extra mile a little bit. 
So that's that's my my two cents on it. So one thing that strikes me a lot about the artists here in the region, uh, especially the contemporary artists, the focus uh, a lot of time the focus on photography and the concept of archival memory and multiple identities. And we see this amongst a lot of the Lebanese artists that we know, uh, Palestinian, Egyptian artists, established ones and others as well. And taking that work and subverting it to their to their own needs. And this is my interpretation that the theme is basically nostalgia and the, the multiple identities that are being formed from those uh, from that archival work. They want to hold on to it. And so they take that piece of art or photograph or something generally and they subvert it and they uh, bend it to their own needs and view of reality. So you're from Lebanon, from Egypt, and then we come here and then you create your own little collage of images and you surround yourself with them. But, but Hashem... I often say this, um, you know, when Middle Eastern art, actually that's not fair, art from the Middle East started to gain attention globally. Why do you think it, it did that? It's because the pockets of diasporic communities in Europe, in North America, we were or still are nostalgic. Yes. And, and the only thing that has a piece of home is food, is culture, is art. That's how we subscribe to it. So we hang on to it that way. But also, when you you know, you know mentioned change and why a lot of local artists and regional artists talk about change and they manipulate images and so on, some of whom I'm, I'm actually working on a project with right now. I mean, let's just think at the start of our conversation. So now, I, I mentioned to you that I lived in Deira, yeah. on the creek. That's the really the pulse of the city. I now live in Um Sukhaim. <laughs> that didn't exist. <laughs> there was nothing there. So geographically, things, I mean, ra radically changed. So it's, it's, it's urban, it's, it's societal, you know. It's, when, when we came to look at schools, I couldn't believe it. I said, oh my God, we had two schools back then, basically. Before we wrap up, Mirna shared a project that's very special to her. A book on His Highness Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan, the founding president of the United Arab Emirates and considered the father of the UAE. So I'm I'm publishing a book with Asulin on uh, Sheikh Zayed. Asulin is um, one of the most prestigious publishers focusing on arts and culture. They have a shop in Dubai Mall. You can also find their books and publications elsewhere in Dubai, including at the Lighthouse in D3. It will be the house's first. Uh, on an Arab and a ruler. Uh, so the idea is to paint a portrait of the man, not the politician. I am responsible for collating thousands and thousands of images. <laughs> and you'd be surprised to know what how, the lengths that I went to to get these images. There was a Gulf News Archive, National Archives, Ramesh Shukla, Noor Ali Rashid, the families, so Al Gurg, Al Futaim, you know, all of them. Um, there was uh, some of the family members gave me photos and then the family as in the, the Al Nahyans and then Christie's believe it or not because they have archival images of him giving Um Kulthum a necklace that, that was an auction I'm still getting more because now that now that people kind of um know about the project and and when they hear oh oh Hashem gave me some images oh really okay fine I'll, I'll give you some so yeah so more people are you know volunteering their images so I've I've gathered pretty much as many images as I as I could and uh, I have a very long essay to write and that is based on interviews with his children diplomats and dignitaries as well as um, a few you know contemporary protagonists because I, I feel that uh, Sheikh Zayed is still alive. You know, he's, he is still here. You, you cannot miss him. And uh, it's, it's all, you know, lovely to talk about, you know, tolerance and, you know, the country launching initiatives like the Abrahamic House and, and whatnot. But these are actually his ideas. So they've just been passed on and, and they're being executed. But he himself was a tolerant man. You know, he was um, very giving, very, very philanthropic. So there's, there's the book. Um, 
There's also a monster project that I'm working on with uh, the Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development. It's called Al Burda, and it takes its name from a poem of epic praise for the Prophet Muhammad. Um, so Al Burda Award was conceived about 15 years ago by Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, and it was launched as an award to recognize uh, artists who practice Islamic art. So a lot of calligraphy, illumination, that kind of stuff. So the government gave 500,000 dirhams to 10 contemporary artists to realize, you know, works that were that are inspired by Islamic art. So they will be unveiled in Abu Dhabi in November and they will go on a global tour for two years. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Lighthouse Conversations. We're produced by Chirag Desai and our content director is Farah Sharif. You can connect with us on Instagram at the Lighthouse underscore podcast for more behind the scenes videos and also to listen to all our previous episodes at thelighthouse.ee slash podcasts.